Hi, folks, and welcome back to Green Planet, Blue Planet podcast, featuring distinctly qualified global change makers that are dedicated to creating a healthier planet. My name is Julian Guderlei. I am committed to a world that allows people from all walks of life to thrive. And today's episode is part of the Design Science Studio collaboration, the series with the Buckminster Fuller Institute um, that I have started because I was part of the first cohort in the Design Science Studio. And my guests are Maxi Cohen and Gina Bria, who are collaborating artists with the DSS, combining filmmaking and anthropology to provide new perceptions of water and raise our reverence for water. What a fitting context for Green Planet, Blue Planet. So I'm super stoked for this conversation, you too. Thank you, Julian, Welcome. for having us. We're really excited. And I believe this conversation will be a rite of passage for your listeners to walk through new ideas about water. And that's our goal here. Wonderful. Let's jump right into the water then. Let's, <laughs> let's, uh, let's get our feet wet. So tell us a little bit, you two, about like, what was the origination point for, for this a movement in water? Um, yeah, like digital and also kind of what I'm understanding, like um, movable art project and exhibition. Go ahead, Maxi. Well, I've been photographing and filming water for, <clears throat> excuse me, about 25 years, basically because I love being in it, that I find being in, in it in hot springs, rivers, oceans, lakes, my bathtub, that uh, I'm just feeling better, thinking better, and it's where my creativity comes alive. And so uh, I, I feel as an artist, as a filmmaker, that it, um, I hold a very privileged position. So if I'm doing anything, I, it comes always from a very intimate place but I feel that it really has to make a difference in the world. And so um, from my filming water, making artworks from water, multimedia works and installations grew this idea of what's really a mobile museum of water, which ultimately is about 10 or 11 experiences that you go through that are totally artful and experiential and engaging in such a way that they create wonder and give you a sense of yourself as, as water, shift your consciousness, um, I believe will uh, shift the way that you think and feel about yourself and conceivably and hopefully will um, inspire action in the world. Uh, whether that is as a child deciding to become a scientist or a conservationist or an artist to an adult becoming a philanthropist or just changing everything about the way that they eat and drink. So that, that was it. And then I was so, 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 so lucky to meet Gina, who um, was really the only person that I met on my own journey here that was thinking about water in a way that deeply resonated with me and excited me because I think the, the journey of transformation of how we change the way we think and feel and work and do whatever has to start from a really intimate place. And Gina knows the science of water in a way that makes that possible. Yeah, I, I, I love um, this concept of thinking about water differently because uh, from my work as an anthropologist, I ended up studying desert people. I was looking for hydration strategies and uh, found out that desert people are better hydrated with uh, less liquid. And I was like, how, wait, how does that, how can that work? We all know it's supposed to be eight glasses a day. I mean, that's science. That's the medical prescription that we've heard since time immemorial. So. Uh, when I found out they were actually hydrating using uh, plants, water locked inside plants. So think aloe, cactus, um, tubers buried under the ground. I looked at desert, each desert spot on the globe and discovered they were all using this strategy, although the plants were different. So what I noticed the commonality in those plants was they each were high, a high gel releasing plant. So you know how that jelly is like in the aloe. And I needed to 
I thought it was like a polysaccharide. I'm like, what is this stuff? Because this is clearly the commonality thing that's hydrating people with, um, you know, these are like nature's water bottles. They, they store water, uh, bring water. So what's that jelly-like stuff? What's its, what's its uh, power and medium? And that led me to um, Gerald Pollack, Dr. Gerald Pollack at the University of Washington, who had written a book on cells, gels, as the engine of life. And I thought, well, that guy knows something about gels. I'm going to call him up. And, um, you know, he didn't know me from Adam, answered the phone, like, okay. I'm like, hi, I'm an anthropologist. <laughs> and I want to know what that jelly stuff is in plants. Uh, can you tell That's me? He's fascinating. Like, oh, he's like, sure. I could tell he wanted a short conversation. Yes, it's concentrated water. And I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Have you just told me water concentrates inside of plants? And he's like, yeah, it happens in all plants, all plant cells, they're living, that's, that's concentrated water. That's what water does when light affects it and you get high uh, con uh, exposure to light, the water will concentrate, the molecules get closer, you get better hydrated. Yeah, that's really great. And I'm like, um, what do you know about hydration? He's like, well, I know nothing about how that works in the body. I just know the science of it. And I'm like, well, don't you think we should collaborate? <laughs> like get this world, get this out into the world. And, um, and so a, a relationship started there where we started hel helping him think about um, how to move this in, uh, practically into the world as, as a body experience, what it would be like. And Julian, the most valuable thing I can say right now, the most interesting thing is that hydration at this concentrated state uh, alters perception. So we, I'm speaking as an ethnographer now, we live in a deeply dehydrating culture um, as moderns. We are not biologically uh, set to live in the environment that we live in. We're biologically compromised. We're all dehydrated, even if we're drinking eight glasses a day, because the water that we are drinking is not this concentrated form. It's broken up by water treatment or being sh uh, pressurized through pipes. So in our industrial society has interfered with water's natural synchronicity to move through this states from liquid, vapor, liquid, and then this jelly-like concentrated state, and then onto ice if it's cold enough. And this jelly-like state where we get our water from plants is the state in which water cleans up, purifies, and conducts all electrical signaling for our cells and for all communication between all other living things. Mine's so already blown. This is awesome. I mean, we had, we had uh, Professor Jerry Pollack on the show. And I mean, this, is, this was an, a whole deep dive of, you know, scientific understanding. For me, um, and you, you just saw me, I just grabbed my water bottle to drink and <laughs> hydrate. But like, yeah, it, it just makes so much sense, right? I mean, plants capture sunlight and turn it into, uh, you know, beautiful green color and, um, and and food for us really and yes. so the same happens with water inside of plants it concentrates in a way that the electric signaling is actually made for our bodies yes and when I met Maxi I was like oh my god here's the plan the plan is she wants to create these this mobile water museum that will people will actually experience uh, a new understanding of water we've got to collaborate because this science understanding matched with the arts and its ability to just pour the information into us without us having to go through a science course. We just experience it, water within and without. And this is this um, information exchange through uh, visual sound, frequency, vibration. And if we can make that mu museum pop up in all different kinds of iterations all over, um, wow, what a beautiful, as I said, rite of passage for people to begin the journey, walking through the open doors, coming out on the other side, experiencing themselves as a vibrational creature made of water molecules, which is how wonderful. Yeah, Only absolutely. I mean, we are we are water beings on a water planet, which is literally one of the reasons why, why I call this, this podcast Green Planet, Blue Planet, is to continue to kind of point at the, the magic in water without necessarily knowing all of, about it myself, but just intuitively understanding that if we are up to 90% water in our bodies, then um, maybe this is, you know, how, how the consciousness talks on our planet. 
Um, really excited to dive a little bit deeper there before we talk about the Design Sense Studio. So what's the plan with, with this tour? You're going to have a multimedia exhibit and also a physical kind of event tour? Maxi. Well, the idea in, in which <clears throat> we are working on <laughs> is to have, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and wait, hold on. Uh, there we go. Uh, have a glass of water. Her that, glass that, of that fits water. the context. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the idea is to, uh, we've designed it to have these experiences be in huge droplets of water. So from the outside, it looks like kind of a cathedral to water. On the inside, it's an experience that e each one of the experiences that you go through is extremely different, but they, and they magnify, they grow in a kind of oblique narrative, they grow to your understanding of how you are water, how much of you, is, how much of you is water and how you're imprinting your own biology. You know, so what you're looking like on the inside based on your mind, your thinking, your communication. And also there is in the inner sanctum, you get to lay down um, and just be surrounded by an extraordinary uh, program that begins with the indigenous people calling in the spirits of the water. And that, that's really a, a global experience. So where we're at at the moment is that we have designed, um, we have designed the experiences and we're looking into how we're gonna make this and we're looking for funding. And that doesn't, at, at the same time, we are taking advantage of opportunities that come our way to create other iterations. So I have a multi-channeled installation piece that can be mounted now. Um, and um, it, we're looking at all kinds of things that we're doing. I mean, even the social media campaign that Gina is mounting is kind of part of this movement because it is helping to create a movement um, that educates people and that changes the way people really think about themselves and and nature around us, which certainly needs our reverence at this moment in time. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it, it totally does. And you know, I'm, I have um, the the exhibit and the drawings of this this water droplet pulled up at the same time here. And I make sure to link this out in the show notes about a movementinwater.com, and um, you can you can find a lot more about the concept and how terrifically beautiful it looks. Right, I I'm with you on this 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 ripple of impact that we as the science science uh, studio participants are, are a part of and, you know, um, are, are just generating everywhere really through the synchronicity of connecting through um, the synchronicity of how many of our communities are actually connected. And, you know, including you listening right now, you're connected to this entire community just by, by lending your ear. And so I'm, I'm curious to dive a bit into the, the DSS and maybe the two of you, how you connected to the Buckminster Fuller Institute or the Design Science Studio cohort itself to say, yes, this is what I need to be a part of because more creative genius will, will come forth. Well, I, I would love to, to share a little story about that because um, uh, I, we created in 2016, we created a TED event called Bodies of Water just to introduce people through four new TED Talks that we uh, crafted and uh, pit, we recorded at the Standard Hotel in New York, including Dr. Pollock's uh, talk on oh, this amazing science that he had figured out there's another phase of water, this concentrated phase called fourth phase, or some people call it structured water, ordered water, liquid crystalline water. There's a lot of names for it right now. He calls it exclusion zone water or easy water. And we wanted, uh, oh, I was in the TED community in New York and I knew, oh my God, we can, we can get you out into the world very quickly. We're gonna do TED Talks. And, um, and 
Uh, we invited a curated audience from, of New Yorkers, many of them involved in the arts and many of them in journalism. So we were really trying to get the science seen and heard in a fun context, like a TED uh, event. And Maxie showed up. <laughs> and um, I think in part, Julian, because we started the TED event by asking a um, grandmother elder to bless the, everyone there with a water song and a water blessing and to, um, and to invoke um, this movement, to invoke everyone at the audience to become part of water protection, water delight, being, uh, finding out more about themselves as, as beings of water, bodies of water. So um, uh, Maxie came up to me during this event and grabbed me and she's like, we're gonna work together, that's it. Uh, you know, and I'm <laughs> like, and, nice. your, and your name is like, <laughs> 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 so, um, so then I end. I, this was when I was in New York City. That I ended up moving to San Francisco to help my husband's elderly parents, and I got invited to event, an event called Planet Home. Also, again, if you notice, this orbiting is getting more and more cohesive. More and more of us are finding each other and circling around in a faster, more accelerated way, but more powerfully. So Planet Home, I get invited, uh, Maxie gets invited, and, um, and we're in a big auditorium. There's lots of people there, and I see an empty seat way down in front because I'm like the A student type, right? I go down, sit in the front seat. I plunk myself down to this sweet guy, and um, I just introduce myself. And it turned out to be George Rebellion, who's on the board of the Buckminster Fuller Institute. That's and awesome. he was like, I care about water deeply. How can we collaborate? So please, you know, find out what we're doing. And then eventually he invited us to apply to the design science studio. Now the design science studio is they, you know, Buckminster looked over the landscape of all the contacts they had and they said, who can we pull in to start uh, sharing their projects with each other just to get out of the knowledge silos because that's part of our problem you're in tech you're in arts absolutely you're in, and and in that pulling us in we started out everybody wanted to say what their project was like this is what i'm doing you know and pretty soon the conversation very quickly switched and i noticed that this is the ethnographic moment i want to pinpoint for people the conversation has shifted from what i'm doing please let me share what i'm doing so you can help me get my message out to wait, I just heard you're doing what? I can help you with that. I can help you with that. So the lofting of collaboration, spontaneous collaboration, it could be a five minute introduction. It could be a, I can fund that for you. It can be a, I know what kind of projector you need in a dome. It's all right there. All of a sudden the resources have cohered and we are being able to do things that we couldn't, we couldn't have done a year ago. Amazing. So that's what the Design Science Studio is a manifestation of uh, places that I see other forms of coll spontaneous collaboration happening all over the map, um, including something, the new app called Clubhouse. And Julian, I'd love to hear you talk about Clubhouse and what your experiences have been on that and as part of this. Yeah, I mean, thanks for throwing a question back at me. Um, Clubhouse has been interesting so far. I, I can't say I've been like, uh, massively active on it as of yet. Certainly planning to, you know, um, dig in deeper and deeper. I'm also, got to be honest, have to, to work around the challenge on uh, having chosen to be on an Android phone. Um, mm. But all of this is always solvable. What I'm experiencing on Clubhouse to answer your question is, it's a place of, similar to what you said, Gina, like these silos of information can suddenly kind of start hopping in between or silos of conversations are now publicly visible and people can start hopping between conversations and kind of cross pollinate ideas, understand what this interest group might be talking about, understand what is synchronistically being talked about over here. Or in other words, it's like as if you were to visualize, you know, if you zoom out a little bit and you visualize that right now, how many Zoom meetings are happening on the planet? Maybe there's like, you know, a few million people on Zoom right now if not hundreds of millions of people. And maybe, I mean, apologize uh, in advance if anybody feels personally uh, um, tr triggered, but maybe 90% of those rooms are, are totally boring. But 10% of those rooms, exciting conversations are happening. And even if it's just 1% of these rooms, 
Now, the problem though, is that I can't get into that Zoom room that's exciting right now because I don't know about it unless I'm already in it, right? And so Clubhouse has kind of turned this around where these rooms are happening thematically people are meeting around topics and, 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 you know, like discussing ideas. And then anybody else can start jumping into this room to contribute with their attention, to contribute with their energy, to contribute with their voice. And the neat thing is, I think because it's, you know, not a video based platform, it's kind of taken the idea of the podcast into a live podcast. And then also it really, you know, I mean, I love seeing the two of you right now. And for everyone watching the video episode, you're probably enjoying seeing our reactions on our face and, you know, our body language. Um, but at the same time, it usually pulls us out of a deeper connection to simply the coherent thoughts that are being shared because there's so much extra kind of visual input that's going on. Right. And so Clubhouse has kind of found that niche where magically conversations that, that maybe wanted to happen for years start to happen. Long answer to a short question, but yeah, and please throw something in, Maxi. I'm, I'm curious, well, what do you think? Say it also deep and um, democratizes the conversation a bit, so there aren't these, uh, you know, these visual filters that create additional bias and um, and therefore exclusion or in, or incorporation. But uh, yeah. And I find, I mean, I went on last night and, you know, Academy Award winning directors were on the conversation that I was on. You know, it, it always amazes me who's showing up. So uh, I so think it's also because we're craving those conversations, don't you think? Like humans are craving, especially now in, in, a, in a, you know, global pandemic uh, situation where, you know, life has just become very different, to say the least, you know, it's we're starting to crave interactions with each other and we're starting to crave this, this synchronicity of, of meeting and cross pollinating to see what else is actually arising. What else wants to emerge? What is, where's the sacred within life that wants to come out and play? I love that. I love that you use the word play because I think play is our fuel. I mean, I think obviously, I think water's our fuel, but I think water's very playful. If you listen to it bubble, <laughs> if you listen to it brook, you know, and stream, you know, it it's very playful, and uh, and that is a quality of water that um, I think is is exciting about becoming more hydrated ourselves, so that we are informed. Uh, uh, literally, water is an exchange of information. It isn't just wet its information and its energy. And this is very exciting because if we recognize that we live in dehydrating environments and that everyone is dehydrated and that we can create ways to hydrate that we hadn't thought of before, for example, that it isn't just on water and water scarcity issues, uh, eating plants, eating a high plant diet that are full of green water uh, that are going to inform us with nutrients and information from the earth. If you eat mushrooms, they're amazingly hydrating and they're full of dirt information and that water molecule transfers that to us. So these are really cool ways to get ourselves rethinking what that water is doing in our body and um, and listening to each other, uh, listening to the verbal of each of us. You know, I happen to think that a um, hearing something through your ear, you know, conversation is an incredibly confessional and intimate form. And um, and when we have a chance to just listen to each other a lot, is that what a huge amount of information is coming into us through vibration Absolutely. frequency? It's it's wonderful. And we are starting, water is starting to spin us faster and faster and accumulate information and package it in new ways. We really are in a completely new environment. And the pandemic itself changed our experience of space, both through isolation and now space is gonna become the new invention, new kinds of spaces. And that's really fun to think about. Indeed, I'm, I'm going to let that sink in. I like I like that invitation to think about new kind of spaces. And there's one of those concepts that came up for me in the the Science Science Studio quite a lot is ontological design, the kind of you know intentful design of spaces for states of being. 
now talk about you know your exhibit again where that's kind of the the, the principal foundation for people to experience themselves as bodies of water primarily right um, maybe we can dig a little bit about kind of the vocabulary that's that's kind of you know surfaced in the design sense studio because it seems to be a very um, common red thread in this interview series that there, there's a need for new language and then there's a need for very intentful language that allows us to, to create experiences and um, exhibits that, that allow for a state of being rather than just for you know, an Instagram photo. Oh boy. Uh, do, you, do you want to talk about that, Gina? <laughs> Well, I, I know you're the master of it, Maxie, which is um, creating uh, visual information uh, that speaks directly to our, our heart and soul uh, through the eyeball, but also through vibration. And sound, sound and movement are essential to the water molecules ability to transfer information. And so the conversation about new language is a very important one. Um, I think in the design world in particular, where we like to talk big words like ontological, which gets scary, you know, it's a big word. <laughs> uh, I happen to love the word ontological. Um, and I would just love, like, I can tell I'm going to walk around today just singing ontological, ontological, you know, ontological. <laughs> it's just going to be like a little tune in my head. But, um, but, uh, it resonates for me because we've been uh, trained through the university system or through our school systems to resonate with certain words. And for our future and to create a future we haven't seen before and dismant not even dismantle the old um, that we need to, we just need to flow past it. We don't even have to dismantle it. It's just gonna disappear in our wake as we create new languages. And a lot of this language is gonna be excitingly visual and auditory and also if we can help make it very plain, clear, clean, plain, simple language, um, we're gonna be golden. I, I will tell you now that I've had a moment to think <laughs> that um, what we're trying to do is create a new visual artistic experience. And because it is totally artful, takes up a huge amount of space. Unfortunately, it's expensive. And because it is an artful experience that speaks to science, they're not really, I'm not gonna say any, because I'm sure there's some that I don't know of precedence which makes it very difficult. Like even in my fundraising, is this art or is this science? And to me, I'm, I'm saying it's art because people who are just interested in science would not say it's science. You know, they wouldn't say, oh, I see the science here. This is not how we communicate science. And yet what is being communicated is such a, uh, is, such a wealth of scientific information experienced in a way that it lands. Like I imagine when you heard the earth was round after thinking it was flat for centuries and centuries, it was hard to buy into it because it, you couldn't see it differently. So what this is aiming to do is give you such a deep experience that you get it. And, and that is new. There aren't, you know, I've, uh, my work is in museums all over the world. I've, I've you know, I, look, I've always had this problem of being on some kind of hybrid edge. You know, I got shown in museums for a while and then I think I wasn't um, uh, esoteric enough, you know. Um, and so then that happened, but then it was very hard to, for me to do television because I wasn't commercial enough. And, and so I've always kind of been in these, sort of on the edge of, of these forms, the documentaries that I've made um, that just because they, and I'm here again trying to do that, just because the what I'm communicating deserves a different form to be able to really be 
felt in a catalytic way, I, I have pushed form. So the forms of my films have been noted for being a breakthrough in form because they weren't done that way. Well, they weren't done that way before because I, they needed to be done that way to, to get what I'm communicating. And so this is true of this as well. To be able to communicate these ideas, what we're creating necessitates this kind of visual language, this kind of experiential language. And so that's the, that's the thing that makes it really exciting, makes it really fresh and innovative. And at the same time, makes us, makes us uncertain where it's gonna get funded and how it's gonna land. Because the best thing would be that it would be a collaboration of both civic cities and educational institutions and art foundations and art institutions. And it, it, it really is there to address science, art, technology, education in a new way. And so it would be great to have the, the support and the labyrinth of what those institutions can create. And that would be new. That's yeah, including community gardens and um, and faucets for clean water for the community. You know, we really have a very big vision that the it's we're all, we aren't doing just blue here. We're also doing the green, and the green has to do with um, uh, helping people discover the powerful place of plants in hydration and the information in plants. That information that plants have to give us right now to help our earth. Um, move to the next stage of healing and recovery. So uh, it's very exciting to hold water, you know, to not be siloed as a blue thing, right? It's like a whole new way of thinking. Well, wait, wait, can we, we uh, have a huge um, display of how to eat your water? And, um, and also what um, unbroken water, water that has this electrical charge that Dr. Yeah. talks about, can do for soil recovery, how quickly it rehydrates all the microbes on, in soils. One growing season, we have the field studies in now through the, our work at the Hydration Foundation, showing that um, if you just give the water a little spin before you let it hit the soil uh, for your agriculture, uh, the microbes rehydrate and they eat up all the glyphosate. I mean, this is a whole new system of uh, uh, decontamination that we can activate that then of course we're eating better plants from those soils. That's with fascinating, a it's fascinating like, little uh, fact, yeah. It's a human loop, it's a, it's a planetary loop. It's the way nature works. Um, it's the way the cosmos works. So, you know, Julian, I know you love the picture of the blue green earth that incredible blue green um, precious thing that we have um, and, and helping us recognize that we are bodies of water on a body of water. It involves plant life too. They are bodies of water on a, uh, where this is, we're all made up. It just keeps water. going and going, right? I mean, <laughs> this is kind of, this is kind of the funny loop that you, you say yes to once you look that way is, is that it's, the interconnection becomes so obvious between all the organisms, be between us as humans, between, you know, the kind of the sheer perfection of us, not just floating around the sun that floats around a black hole, but also how all of the, the little microbes interact with the soil and how then that feeds our microbiome and how that then makes us healthy. And then, so once you start looking this way, the interconnection becomes plainly obvious, but I think, you know, what, what you both were saying right there is, um, you, you found a different way to express kind of the tagline of the Design Science Studio, also of Buckminster Fuller's famous quote, life that works for 100% of life, or, you know, a life that, a, a world that allows 100% of life to thrive. It's in a different way, I think I heard you say it is um, a different kind of life, a one that we haven't experienced yet. And that's an interesting one, because all of the ways how we're trying to, even in, in, in the, the current pandemic, trying to control health down to certain uh, reductionistic scientific factors, it's very unlikely that that's going to create a different kind of world, because we kind of already came from this world, you know? So um, I think it's time for more people to look this way. And there's something powerful, Maxim, what you said about 
in, I would call it inactive environments, right? Environments that are designed for learning where you step in and you're experiencing something rather than just understanding knowledge or rehearsing knowledge, but the experience in your own physical cells is then so deeply imprinted that you can never really let it go again, which is not to kind of drift off, but this is, I think also one of the big, one of the very, very big arguments in the, you know, um, psychedelic studies and the, you know, in the work that MAPS is doing and in other organizations. I want to hear maybe an anecdote or, or, or a little story from the design science cohort one that the two of you experienced, something that you loved, even something that you didn't like, um, anything that you want to throw out there for, you know, people that are listening are highly encouraged to uh, apply for one of the future cohorts. This is a decade long experience. And so, um, Maxi, Gina, what, what was, you know, a, a moment worth mentioning in the last six months? Does anything come top of mind for you, Maxie? Yeah, I will tell you that uh, the serendipity mm -hmm. of someone showing up to say, which is what happened with us with Tom Kohler, who said, uh, you know, this is really great. I'm gonna help you move this forward. Uh, and actually showed up every week to help, uh, help in his, um, in, 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 in a very methodical way, you know, kind of a zoom out way, help, helped make us progress um, and give a certain kind of grounded reality encouragement that this fantastical and ambitious project could and would actually land. That, was extraordinary. And, and actually that has been multiplied for me by any number of people who have, um, who, who, who have not only been able to kind of add to us, but that I feel I can add to them, which, is, which also feels great, that kind of energy exchange and the other thing is, is that we have found collaborators. You know, we have found people within yes. the cohort that will make what we're doing just even better and greater. And that's very exciting because all of this was so serendipitous. You know, I mean, it, it, it has been really quite spontaneous. I have felt really, I, I felt the same way today, uh, all these months later, that I haven't had the time to read everybody's resume and interview and what they're doing. And uh, I have felt so kind of guilty because I feel like I, 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 it's been such an honor to get to know everyone that I have gotten to know. And I keep thinking about who am I missing? What am I missing by not having time to do this? But the truth is whatever has spontaneously arisen from this opportunity has certainly catapulted this project forward. Um, and that has been a, truly a gift to be in that level of flow and to have this kind of magic show up. That's, that's, really, that's really been great. And for me, also, I'm, I'm older than a number of people that are in the cohort, and it's been a gift to be able to see much more of the future and be pushed into that future. Uh, and so, I, you know, it's been hard for me to kind of visualize what we're doing in the virtual world. And now I realize, you know, one has to really consider that. So it's been a gift on so, so many levels. Exciting. I'm going to definitely double tap on the fact that there is this increased amount of flow and, you know, kind of moments of spontaneous collaboration where you suddenly find yourself in a breakout room with like three to four to six people. And you're like, who are these people? And then 10 minutes later, you're like, oh my God, these are the, the friends I always knew I, I'm going to find someday, you know, and, and suddenly there's, there's somebody who's going to collaborate with you right. on uh, a project or on a passion project or on your work or whatever it is. There's these, these moments of human ingenuity, you can't really engineer for them, but you can create space for them to happen when people show up for who they really are. Uh, Julian, I wanna make sure that your listeners know that this is all open. 
they are invited to come near and orbit with us. Anybody can uh, join. Uh, the, there's, uh, there's sessions with astounding thinkers. They're, it's all up on YouTube. Um, anybody's willing. This is the this conversation around space that I mentioned with, with the pandemic has changed our sense of space. So a lot of walls have fallen down where it's not like an exclusive group that you've got to get into anymore. Uh, anywhere in the world, new people are showing up and you, you could suddenly call whoever you want uh, or you can find them on um, you know Instagram or you can, there's new conversations that are happening, new accessibility, both bo that, that goes um, throughout the entire cycle. And I think this is a feature of life itself, pushing us together and accelerating our abilities because life itself wants to evolve to the next place it's urgent because I think life feels it's under threat um, or maybe just call it a phase shift. Maybe it's not so threatening. Maybe it's just how we're gonna get this next level of evolution done that will take care of a lot of the problems that have shown up to, as the pressure that gets us to the next, um, the, the, you know, the stresses, the hormetic stresses on, on the planet that move us into um, new evolution and I think by thinking about it biologically like that is great, but that's abstract. Let's tell people, you know, come find us online. Go um, apply, yeah. Go apply, <laughs> look at the YouTube um, uh, in uh, live. Um, there's on Facebook, there's incredible speakers. Anybody? Really, there, there's a bit everywhere, right? If you yeah. if you take the time to Google the Science Science Studio, I'm also linking it out um, on both the landing page for this series, also in the show notes for this episode. So people know this is an invitation for the entire next decade. And, you know, this is um, maybe my closing question to the two of you. Do you feel like you were part of cohort one or do you feel you're part of the entire decade? Oh my God, our project is so big. I hope I'm part of the whole decade. I mean, you know, <laughs> we're not done. And, and actually to anybody listening to your podcast, if, if they see a, a, a a role or a part of this, I, I hope they would be in touch with us. Let let this flowering continue. Right. Yes, yeah. this is. Um, I, I agree. It's it's a uh, we're in the flow of water, and um, we've all been we all landed here, uh, selected by life to drop us little bacterias right now in this space. I, we don't know why, but I think uh, my favorite um, my favorite illustration is bacteria. Um, actually once they hit a quorum they actually light up and they're not able to uh, bioilluminate before a certain measure of cohesion and and uh, numbers have occurred and suddenly they all have a quality they never knew they had they're shocked <laughs> they're shocked that they can light up uh, but only because by nature um, once you have that quorum uh, completely new qualities emerge and I think that's where we are in the evolution of of life and nature right now. It's a very exciting time. May so, it be so. I love that. No. That's a great example. That's a really great example. <laughs> Julian, I, I just, I can I sneak in one tiny tip? One more question or tip? <laughs> it's a hydration experience I just want you to have right now, which is uh, okay. to discover yourself as a dynamic flow agent and yourself as a body of water. It's so simple. You can do this while you're on the cell phone or ever, but if you drop your chin all the way to your chest right now. Just take your chin and press it against your chest and lift your head again. You can take a deep breath in if you want. Drop your chin one more time and uh, lift it again. And what you've just done is flush your entire synovial canal down your spine. And you've created a hydration flow that's bringing in fresh oxygen, fresh hydration to your brain, to your whole system, moving yourself as a liquid dynamic force. Um, in miniature to what the whole planet looks like. So it's a great. Beautiful. A little participatory uh, activity at the end of this episode. So if you, wherever you're listening, unless you're driving, um, go, go for it and, 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 and do the little chin to the chest plate. Definitely a wonderful yogic stretch to open mm -hmm. the fluidity of our bodies. I love it. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Maxie. This was fun. It was fun. Yes. Right. Yeah.